Over the last few years, this new style of filmmaking has gotten pretty popular online. It's kind of cool and trendy and synonymous with cool shots and no shortage of flashy editing. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for it, but with so much emphasis on the cool stuff like FPV drones and clever transitions, it can be easy to kind of glaze over those really fundamental building blocks of a good film. So in today's video, I want to walk you through four different areas that I would say are kind of the most overlooked and most important, most fundamental areas of our craft that just don't get talked about nearly as much as they should. First up, composition. This is the most simple thing. It's pretty much just where you stand, what lens you use, and where you point the camera. But as simple as it is, it's still very important to be intentional and thoughtful when you're making those decisions. So let's take a look at how I composed this shot that you just saw of me walking down the trail into frame. And of course, the first step is just to keep an eye out for composition. So what drew me to this shot in the first place was its composition, particularly the lines, the lines created by the trees in the background, very parallel and repeating all throughout the frame. And also this kind of curvy line leading up to the camera created by the trail. I thought those two different types of lines combined created a really interesting scene. What I want to emphasize about this location is the scale. We're on this huge switchback where the trail kind of joins between two mountains and it's just a very big open expansive space so i want to emphasize that in the way that i shoot so i'm using my trusty 14 millimeter lens to capture as much of this wide space and show as much of that large trail opening up as possible this was my starting point for this shot it's basically the easiest most simple way to frame this up just exactly where I was standing when I pulled out my camera and centering the trail right in the middle of the frame. But you'll notice the side of the mountain off to the left side of the trail is taking up like half of the frame and it's kind of preventing us from emphasizing that open space as much as I want to. So for that reason, I decided to pan the camera a little over to the right, frame the trail up on the left third of the image and instead frame the shot that way to emphasize that open space on the right. But you'll notice that actually introduces a new problem into the shot, which is this big patch of bush off to the right side of the camera, which blocks the view down into the valley and prevents us from really emphasizing that scale once again. So another easy fix here, I've just moved the camera forward about five feet so that that bush is no longer in frame and we can see down into the valley, see how far back that scene expands and how much open space there is. So you can see how those couple of simple but intentional tweaks can take a still very cool shot and just make it serve the scene and serve the situation a little bit better. Next up, lighting. And controversial opinion here, but I would go as far as to say lighting is pretty much 90% of what decides whether or not an image looks good or looks cinematic, whatever you wanna say. Don't be fooled by all of the clouds behind me. It's the middle of the day and it is bright as hell. It's high contrast. I'm honestly having a pretty tough time exposing these shots and working with this light because it's just so contrasty and direct and intense. But there's some things you can do to get around it and still get a nice image. In this case, the sun is right over here to my left and would be hitting me directly, but I've set up this shot such that this convenient tower here is blocking the light from hitting me. So I'm in the shades. You'll notice I'm a bit darker than the background, but that's what we have to do to make sure that the light on my face is smooth and not being super high contrast and crazy. Now, let's say you're in one of those rare situations where you don't happen to have a fire tower handy while you're shooting and you can't just hide in the shade. Well, there are still things you can do to improve the light and make it look better on camera. Let me show you one. Just come around here to the other side. So you can see now that I'm on the opposite side of the tower, the sun is right in my face, just direct, completely unblocked by anything. And it's not doing me any favors. It looks pretty terrible. But the simple solution to that is to shoot like this with the sun right behind you. This is called backlighting and it will enable you to get smooth light because the light's not hitting you or your subject 
directly. And it's still not perfect. Like obviously the background is completely blown out. There's still a lot of contrast in the scene, but I think it's better than that awful harsh light. So if you're shooting in more harsh lighting conditions, try shooting into the light rather than in the same direction as the light. And you might be pleased with the results. And it's not just about working with natural light. I mean, that's most of it, most of the time, but I wanna show you a couple of handy little tools that live in my camera bag. They are on this side. This is the Panel Pro by LumCube, and this is the Panel Mini, also by LumCube. And these are just little LED light panels that I carry around in my bag all the time that I can use to easily add some extra light into a shot. They're super small, portable, easy to use, battery powered. They're the best option in my opinion for the kind of thing that I do because they can just live in my camera bag and have a very small footprint, but come in absolutely clutch when I need them. I think a lot of travel filmmakers kind of write lighting off just because they're like, I'm shooting in natural light, what are you gonna do? But there's quite a bit you can do. You just gotta get creative, assess the scene, and make some tweaks and decisions to make that light that you're working with look the best it possibly can. The other half of this video pertains to the post-production process. So I'm gonna go ahead, hike down, head back into the editing bay and we'll dive into that. But before I go, I just wanna briefly tell you about the sponsor of today's video which is ArtGrid. ArtGrid is a massive library of amazing stock footage shot by filmmakers all over the world. So you can get pretty much anything you're looking for on here. It's great for travel filmmakers and there's new material added every single day. And one of my favorite things about ArtGrid is that it's super simple. So there's just one license that covers everything. It covers commercial use, your client's use of the footage. There's no limits on the audience size or the number of views the content can get. And you can also continue to use that footage even if you don't renew your subscription. Under that one license, there are three different subscription options based on the quality of footage that you need to download. So for just $25 a month, you can download anything in their library in HD. For $40 a month, you can download it in 4K and 8K. And for $50 a month, you can download it in 4K and 8K in log and even sometimes raw. I use their footage on a bunch of different projects for a bunch of different reasons, whether that's adding some spice with a cool overlay, getting a shot that I wouldn't have been able to realistically get myself, or even just adding in something that I forgot to get on location. This is a 12 mile hike. My brain is kind of turning to goo and I'm only halfway in, so I'm sure something is gonna get left behind at some point. But ArtGrid is always there to help out and they're also just a big supporter of this channel. So thank you ArtGrid. And if you wanna try it out for yourself, there will be a link in the description of this video. And you can sign up through that link to get your first two months completely so now we are back in the editing bay. I am chopping up this video as we speak, a little meta, but stay with me here because I want to talk to you about editing. Like editing at its most basic. Strip out all of the fun stuff, the transitions, the effects, literally just like how you cut your clips. There's nothing fun and flashy about this, but it's so incredibly important and there's so much more to it than meets the eye. Now, ultimately, I would break this down into a few different key components, one of which is the broader big picture, how you structure the different sequences of your edit and how you kind of organize the piece as a whole. Zooming into the timeline a little more, this is also about which clips you choose to include in your timeline and how you order those clips to make sense, make them a cohesive story and progression through the video. And finally, to get even more detail than that, editing is about how you cut those clips, where you move from one clip to the next in order to maintain continuity and pacing and flow. The intro to this video is a good example. It took me a lot of time and little tiny adjustments to put that together and not because of like the transitions and the effects, but because of just the basic edit, which clips I wanted to use and how I wanted to cut them together. The intro has to do a few different things at once. On the most basic level, it needs to get us from this desk to the trailhead of the hike that we're doing throughout the video. It needs to show the 
progression and the process of getting ready and going out on that shoot. But at the same time, it needs to set up the premise of what I'm talking to you about in this video. It needs to establish what the video is about. And that's why I'm choosing certain clips. When I'm talking about getting cool shots, I put clips of the drone on screen. When I'm talking about a certain type of filmmaking, we put the camera on screen. I'm talking about flashy editing. Let's put a shot of the timeline on the screen. And probably the trickiest part in this case is that an intro needs to be short and to the point. The sequence couldn't drag on too long. So probably 80% of the drone shots that I filmed didn't make it into the intro. A lot of the stuff that I shot in the car, kind of getting ready to go out on the hike, cut that stuff out, would have made it too long. Those decisions are the ones that are really the backbone of good editing. Which clips are you deciding to use? How are you ordering them? And how are you cutting them together? And finally, this is gonna be a surprise to absolutely no one. Let's talk a bit about sound design. And here's the great thing about sound design, right? Plenty of people just skip it. Just don't even try. And even then, most people still aren't really sinking their teeth into it and getting its full potential out of it for their films. So just by showing up, you're already ahead. I've made like seven or eight different videos all about sound design. So I'll link my playlist up here so you can go learn all about it there. But what I'll say in this video, kind of the big picture, is just that once you stop approaching sound design as like this boring but mandatory final step and approach it rather as the creative opportunity that it actually is and really sink your teeth into what you can do with it, it'll change your work completely. It'll elevate your films to a completely different level. Half of video is sound design. It's corny and you've heard it a million times, but you've heard it a million times because it's true. It just is. So that being said, let's run that intro back one more time, make this video just a little more meta and strip out the music and the voiceover and just show you the sound design. There's honestly nothing better than a really cool FPV drone shot or a really clever transition. They're the best, but they're not enough to single-handedly make a great film. They're smaller elements within a much larger craft. And filmmaking as a craft is about all of those different elements coming together and working cohesively towards a central concept, a central theme. And of all of those elements, unfortunately, the most basic tend to be the most important and the ones that you should be devoting the most time and effort to. They're a foundation, you could say, and without them, everything else kind of just crumbles. FPV stuff's cool though. I really hope we can get some more FPV shots in a video on this channel soon. Hopefully soon, fingers crossed. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video learned something new from it, found it informative, more of a reminder than a tutorial, I suppose, but I hope it was a helpful one. If so, feel free to show your support, by leaving a like on the video, sharing it with your friends, or even subscribing to my channel. I upload new videos just like this every week or two at the moment, semi-consistently. So subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and I'll see you there.